The alala, which is a corvid found only here in Hawaii, disappeared from the wild in 2002. It's only found in our breeding facilities today. And so there's 112 adults in total. So it's really one of the rarest birds in the world. My first encounter with the alala was 1988. I guess 98 or so was probably the last time I saw alala in the wild. It was uh, my junior year in high school and uh, there were three birds, uh, two adults and, and one immature. They were foraging in the bark of the trees, they were foraging the foliage and so forth. One of the wild pairs flew down to the high school campus and landed in an African tulip tree and was vocalizing for a good 20 to 30 minutes. Off in the distance you hear this alala call echoing across the forest and it and it just it, it's like a it's like like you know I'm I'm just entering somebody else's kingdom altogether I think those kinds of personal experiences are ones that really sort of cement you know the, you know sort of the resolve that keeps me going uh, with conservation I was lucky I got exposed to it when I was a junior in high school so it really had an impact on me then and all my classmates because we were given that rare opportunity we were surveying um, the Kona Refuge vegetation surveys, and I was very saddened to learn that roughly about six months later, the last two had perished for unknown reasons. Yeah. My dad, Winbanko, was the one who introduced me to Alala, and uh, that was back in the early 1970s, 1972 to be exact. And he'd already been working on surveys of Alala starting in about 1969. They are truly an omnivore, but with a very strong fruit uh, preference. They really um, would just completely, almost peel the bark off sections of trees, searching for isopods, for you know insects, arthropods, larvae. There's a seam on the hoava nut that it would kind of orient toward its beak, and they would just split that seam to open it up, so. It was a pretty, pretty neat technique. It's a big nut for them to carry, um, but once they grabbed one and could move off to a branch and open it, they, you know, the wild birds, the adult wild birds, they definitely had it figured out. Alala was a species that everybody pretty much knew, and, and most people who are long-term residents had some kind of history with. So my earliest recollection of Alala was in 1958. I was a wee child. The red lehua trees were filled with these alala. They were big and bold and bossy and scolding me. So blessed that we've had that opportunity to see them. Um, I've been coming up to the ranch since I was five. When I was young, they were everywhere. From 1993 to 1998, I led tours up there. And whenever we did find them, we would spend quite a bit of time, as much time as we possibly could, observing them. I heard all kinds of calls, and I have absolutely no idea what they were trying to communicate. None at all. However, um, in later years, when there were fewer birds, I used to go up and call them, and they'd come in. So who knows what I was saying? We're here at the Keoho Bird Conservation Center on the Big Island of Hawaii. So for many years, the alala population in the wild started to decline and they got down to extremely low numbers of only about 20 birds left in the wild back in the 1990s. And that's when we stepped in to try to save the species from extinction and bring it back again. This alala egg is extremely exciting. It's the very first egg to hatch this season and it's unique because it's the earliest egg that has ever hatched in over 20 years of breeding. When we get a brand new chick, it's lots of work to take care of them. Our hardworking staff work from 6 in the morning until 8 in the evening and feed the chick every other hour. We have these specialized incubators that we use to keep the eggs warm at a constant temperature and constant humidity. And that's just to make sure that the conditions are perfect for the egg to develop and hatch successfully. 
What we're doing with these eggs that are hatching is we'll take a DNA sample from these and send it off to the University of Hawaii at Hilo. And researchers there will do a big genetic study to determine if there's certain genes that are associated with eggs that are more likely to hatch than others. When a species gets down to a small population size, they tend to lose a lot of genetic diversity. So we're trying to understand how much genetic diversity they have left and trying to figure out, um, using the genetics, how to manage the population, how to help reintroduce those birds back into the wild. The awala are an important part of the forest. I mean, they're an important seed disperser of the native Hawaiian plants, and they're also really important from a cultural perspective. Alala are very intelligent birds and they're really susceptible to imprinting. So we use hand puppets to feed them when they're young to avoid them imprinting onto us. We just completed a study on the foraging behavior of alala, and we found that alala use tools to extract food from small holes and crevices. Alala mostly use small sticks from native Hawaiian trees that they find on the ground as tools to extract food items. We've known for a long time that alala are extremely intelligent, but it wasn't until we conducted this study that we realized just how skilled alala are at using tools. For example, nearly all adult alala use tools and they can all extract a food item from a small crevice in less than one minute. Alala are now one of only two species of crows or ravens around the world that use tools completely on their own. Today, the first cohort of Alala received a pre-transfer exam, which was a thorough physical exam and a West Nile virus vaccine. The birds were individually transported from their aviary here at the Bird Conservation Center. They came into our hospital clinic here and each were individually weighed. And then each bird had a thorough physical exam where we checked all of the body systems and looked for any signs of illness or disease. The alala that we examined today are between four and six months old. And this group was composed mostly of males. Uh, the second group that will be released a couple months later will be mostly females. And together, this first group will be of an even sex ratio. During the examinations of the alala, we had our veterinarians from the San Diego Zoo who were assisting with that procedure. Um, and we also had our staff present as well and our interns, uh, both our team from here from the Keho Bird Conservation Center, as well as our team that will be monitoring the birds after release into the wild. Their IDs were confirmed, which is a leg band that has a specific number on it. Overall, the birds look to be in very good health and very good condition. As a veterinarian, it's very exciting to be part of this project to make sure that all of the birds are in good health and fitness and we really want all of the birds to be successful when they're released into the wild. I think everyone is excited uh, for the next step. It just needs to be given the opportunity to flourish and then appreciate it for what it's worth. So it'll be great to get birds back in the forest. We really have to be dedicated to the long-term recovery of these birds. I think we can, but we have to really persevere to do it. I want to see the alala just swarming the countryside. Get as many birds out there as you can. Alala will be released in a natural area reserve close to a volcano here on Hawaii Island. This coming release is the first release since the 1990s. So it's extremely exciting for the alala to be back in the wild again. <laughs>